Hi, I'm James Dickey, Senior Trial Counsel for the Upper Midwest Law Center, the Minnesota nonprofit public interest law firm that fights for liberty and the rule of law. Welcome back to Minnesota Law Weekly, where Doug Seaton and I update you on important developments on legal issues in Minnesota and how we at UMLC are your voice fighting for you in the courts. Today we are talking more about the Professional Educator Licensing and Standards Board, or PELSBs, new requirements for teacher licensure and the major problems they will create. Here with me is Katrin Wigfall of the Center of the American Experiment. Katrin, welcome to Minnesota Law Weekly. Thanks James for having me, glad to be here. We are so glad to have you with us. So Katrin, first please tell us about yourself and your role at the Center of the American Experiment. So I started at Center of the American Experiment in 2017, and I focus primarily on K-12 education and labor unions. And I work on K-12 education because I used to be a classroom educator. And so I come from a family of educators, and uh, the topic is very near and dear to my heart, and we have a lot of work to do to make education better in Minnesota. Oh, I agree with you on that for sure. And last week on Minnesota Law Weekly, I briefly talked with our audience about the legal issues with the Pelsby's new teacher licensing standards. But let's go a little bit deeper into that. First, who is going to be impacted by this new set of rules? This will impact teachers looking to be licensed in the state, whether or not they want to teach at a public school or a private school. Uh, the board behind these changes, Pelsby, they are members appointed by Governor Tim Walz, so it is his board, and these proposed changes are expected to go into effect July 2024. And so we're just very concerned about what these changes mean for educators and the teaching profession as a whole. And let's talk a little bit from a policy perspective. What are the problems with the approach that the Pelsby has taken? Where do we begin? <laughs> so these proposed rule changes really politicize teacher training requirements. And they're not academic. They're ideological. And we see language stemming from critical race theory to gender ideology to identity politics. And unfortunately, this is not the first time that Pelsby has tried to politicize mm -hmm. teacher training requirements. They have been trying to get uh, versions of the current revisions uh, proposed since 2019. Prior to that, they changed the definition of cultural competency training. And we actually spoke out against that redefinition in 2018, because even then, Pelsby was trying to dictate the design and the method of cultural competency training. And it really made that training very highly charged and ideological. And it, it almost appeared to be an ideo ideological litmus test. Mm. And we fear that that is also the case with these proposed rule changes. So there are other ways that Pelsby has been political. We're going to expose how the board has retroactively revised cut scores for mm. teacher licensure uh, under the name of racial equity so that 95% of all teacher candidates of all races will pass. Wow. Shocking. <laughs> that, is an, that is a very, very high number. Um, so let me ask, you mentioned before that you feel the negative impact of these changes actually on a personal level. Um, so talk about that impact that you and others with experiences like yours um, would be facing. Well, I mentioned I was a classroom teacher. I taught elementary and middle school in Arizona. Mm. Uh, I come from a family of teachers. My grandma taught in a one-room schoolhouse. My mom was a teacher. My older sister is still a teacher in southern Minnesota. And so I think about the students I taught, the students my family taught and is currently teaching, and I had a diverse classroom of students, and I can't imagine looking them in the eyes and limiting uh, their individual self-worth and how they view themselves and society. And unfortunately, the language in these proposed standards does just that. It removes uh, the unique and complex individuality of students, of teachers, and it's, it's very alarming. I just want to read a couple examples of what those standards of effective practice will require of teachers. Uh, that a teacher fosters an environment that ensures student identities such as sex and gender, gender identity, sexual orientation are affirmed and incorporated into a learning environment. Uh, the teacher will have to assess how their biases 
perceptions and academic training may affect their teaching practice and perpetuate oppressive systems. Uh, the teacher has to understand how white supremacy undermines pedagogical equity. So this will put teachers in a very hard position who just want to uh, teach students and hold them to high levels of academic excellence. Right, and so in terms of, instead of teaching, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic and having uh, other academic goals for students, teachers are going to be forced to look at themselves from an entirely different lens, take away the individuality that you mentioned, um, and make their classrooms into essentially a groundwork for indoctrination. And pushing back on these standards poses a real rhetorical challenge to educators, to concerned Minnesotans, because a lot of the words in these standards should reflect ideas and words that we can get behind, ideas that stem from anti-racism. We want a, a racist free society. Absolutely. Uh, we want to include all students and, and, and celebrate diversity, uh, but that diversity should be diversity of, of viewpoint and mm -hmm. perspective. And so we're really in in a, uh, I think, a war of words. When you look at these words, uh, we're looking them up in the same uh, dictionary, perhaps, but they have different definitions. And how those definitions then are put into practice, that real world application, is where a lot of this concern is stemming from. Oh, I can totally see that. And there's also, in addition to the confusion created by these words, there's also some confusion about the impact of these rules. Mm. So without question, they do apply to teacher preparation providers, they apply to aspiring educators, and those teachers who are seeking a Tier 3 license, as it's known via the portfolio process. But they also leave open the possibility, as I understand the law to say, of affecting those who are undergoing annual evaluations. And it's unclear exactly at this point what the impact of these rules on those annual evaluations might be. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yes, this has been a gray area for educators who are trying to figure out, will I be impacted or not if I am a currently licensed teacher in the classroom? Now, Pelsby has said they will not be a renewal requirement, but as you and I look at state statute and read it, it's really unclear uh, whether the future interpretations by Pelsby will make this a renewal requirement. They may try to indirectly embed it into cultural competency uh, training, uh, which is required for license renewal. Now, as we think about that requirement, I, I want educators to know that that training requirement does not have to be Pelsby approved to fulfill that renewal requirement. And that is really key because I don't think educators are aware of that. Hmm. That's really important to know. Thank you for pointing that out. You know, it's funny to me is because last I heard, and especially as there was a lot of conversation about uh, last fall about the, um, the racist provision of the Minneapolis teachers contract mm -hmm. with the school district uh, that would require white teachers to be fired first ahead of minority teachers. Um, one of the defenses to that was, well, it's not really a big deal yet because, you know, there aren't going to be any layoffs in the near future because we have a teacher shortage. So last mm -hmm. I heard, there was a teacher shortage in Minnesota. And so my question to you from an empirical fact standpoint is how do you expect these rules will impact the number of teachers and good teachers available to Minnesota public school students. I am very concerned that these rule changes will exacerbate the teacher shortage we are experiencing. I think we run the risk of deterring interested, aspiring educators from entering the classroom out of fear that they will have to demonstrate a type of ideological litmus test just to serve our students. And I fear that it will also uh, prevent teachers of color from entering the classroom to, to teach our diverse and growing uh, student body. And so you think about one of the requirements I read is that the teacher will have to affirm a student's gender uh, identity. And a lot of those elements really could discourage, uh, I think, of Muslim teachers and educators from joining the profession because it really runs counter to an identity-based uh, representation goal that we're told to aspire to. Right. So it, it's, I think it's just bad for educators, it's bad for students, and it's bad for the teaching profession as a whole. Are there any other practical problems with these standards that you might anticipate? 
Well, we think that there will be core challenges uh, from a civil liberties perspective. So there'll be civil liberties advocates saying, you know, wait a minute, this violates my personally held beliefs, uh, convictions. And so we see that likely coming down the pipeline. You know, maybe UMLC will be involved in that front. Um, we made some statements that are <laughs> along that line, along those lines. But we also want to think about what are the alternatives to state certification. These mm. changes are coming down from state licensing requirements, and that puts private institutions, religious institutions, who offer teacher prep programs uh, between a rock and a hard place. They want to prepare educators for the class. Classroom, but they don't want to prepare them to teach or say things that go against their, their religious beliefs. So I, I think it will be important for us to think through how can private institutions develop their own teacher training and certification programs for religious schools and other schools to use. Um, and we also need to be aware that this just didn't come out of thin air. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the language in Minnesota's proposed revisions to the standards of effective practice came from Illinois. Illinois is going through similar licensing changes right now. Theirs are set to go into effect. Uh, theirs focus on culturally responsive teaching and leading and same type of opposition to Minnesota's. Now theirs actually were even more direct with uh, the political agenda that they're pushing because they had language that said educators would have to embrace and encourage progressive viewpoints and perspectives. Hmm. Right there, progressive viewpoints wow. and perspectives. Uh, opposition to that got the language changed to a balance of viewpoints and perspectives. So the word <laughs> progressive different. was changed to yeah. a balance of. However, there's still concern that that's not enough because the true political agenda has been exposed and what that will mean for Illinois students and teachers remains to be seen. Uh, I do want to clarify, though, that these rule changes don't impact K-12 academic standards. Mm -hmm. Those come from the Minnesota Department of Education, and they also don't affect curriculum. So school boards still have control over curricula selection and approval, and so that is why that local involvement at the community level uh, among parents, grandparents, concerned community members is so important because school boards still have control over that. And it is really important to recognize, especially for those school board members out there, that they do have control over curriculum. They do not have to delegate or cede their control to the superintendent in their district or another figure that uh, would love to take control instead. So it's really important for school board members to know that uh, and parents to know that too. So thank you for pointing that out. Absolutely. And just with the parent piece too, taking it a step further. So you have school board members roles, but also the parent role. And for parents to know that under state statute, you can object to instructional materials that your child is receiving in the classroom. And the school district must make reasonable arrangements for alternatives. So parents have rights. They don't check those rights at the schoolhouse door. And it's important for them to know how to exercise those rights. That's exactly right. It's written right in state statute. And you know, one of the things uh, uh, one last uh, thing to point out is this concept that somehow private schools and uh, religious schools might actually have to go about finding a different method of mm -hmm. certifying and uh, licensing teachers to, to have some standard of competency for those who wouldn't be willing to give up their religious beliefs to teach in public school. That's a frightening concept that we'd have that kind of bifurcation in our state. It really is. It's, I think, a step backward for educational freedom and, and what we hope to accomplish as a state to prepare our next generation of leaders to enter society as informed citizens. So I, I, I'm very nervous about what this means for K-12 education, but also for the teaching profession. And American Experiment will stay on top of this, and uh, I know UMLC will as well. Well, we're glad to have American Experiment on top of this, and we certainly will stay on top of this. Serious problems abound. And that's it for this week on Minnesota Law Weekly. You can learn more about the Upper Midwest Law Center by visiting umlc.org. And you can also make a confidential tax deductible donation on our website or by sending us a check to 8421 Wyzetta Boulevard, Suite 300, Golden Valley, Minnesota, 55426. Likewise, you can learn more about Katrin's work at American Experiment by visiting americanexperiment.org and you can make tax-deductible donations to support their work as well by clicking on the Donate button on their website. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Katrin, and thank you all, and we'll see you next week.